Hi, and welcome to Kaleidoscope. I'm your host, Rachel Elliott. We're here this week with Dick McMichael. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. McMichael. My it's pleasure. Nice, nice to have you on the show. So, Mr. McMichael, tell our viewers about your background, where you're from, and about your family, and how you got your start. Well, I will do that, and I'll tell you that you can really find out about that by getting a copy of this book, uh, The Newsman, a memoir by me. And so, one of the things you'll find in that book is that I was born on Britt Avenue in East Winton in 1930. And uh, it was a house that my father had built, and it's very small, and it's still there uh, to this day. Wow. And I, I grew up uh, basically in the first years in the East Winton area, and we, we moved on over to uh, Macon Road. And I guess it was by design, I'm not sure, but the house that we lived in was about a very short block from Winton School. And uh, East Winton School, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, the great historic school, the school, the oldest still operating elementary school in the state of Georgia. I went there, my mother went there, my sister went there, my brother went there. It was sort of a family tradition. And we were about, about a, a half block away, really. And then we moved downtown in about 1940. And again, we were about a half a block away from the elementary school where I would be going. We lived at 11 and a nine and a half Fifth Avenue at that time. And I went to 11th Street Elementary School. Now, 11th Street Elementary School, which is still standing, it's across from uh, St. Luke's Community okay. Building there, uh, was the first Columbus High School. And it was built in the late 1800s. And then they moved out in the 20s, I guess in the late 20s, out to where they are now uh, on uh, Cherokee. And they converted that into an elementary school. And so I went to that school, elementary school. And the interesting part of that is, is that over the years, uh, that no longer was a public school. And they sold it to some lawyers uh, and who kept it and maintained it and because it is historical. And today, it is once again an elementary school. It, it is owned by St. Luke Methodist Church and doing the same thing it did probably in many different ways when I was a child. So it came full circle and you, you got to see that. that. Right. That's really awesome. And after your elementary school, where did you attend high school? Well, I went to Jordan High School uh, that wasn't a family tradition. My brother went to Columbus High, my sister went to Columbus High. But being greatly in, uh, influenced by the kids in the neighborhood, they all decided they were going to Jordan. And it was, it was frankly a little bit harder academically at Columbus High School. And I wasn't that great a student and I knew it uh, academically. And so I went to Jordan, never, never regretted it. Uh, it worked out very well for me because I found something really great there. I found uh, uh, the, the band. And up until I found the band, the school was just school. And fortunately, uh, Bob Barr took over while I was there. And a lot of people know about Bob Barr. You have the Bob Barr Community Band named after him. And when he came aboard, we had about a 17-piece band that wasn't very good at all. Had a student director. Uh, he played the clarinet and he was also a football player, so it made it rather difficult doing football season because he couldn't play with the band and be, in, be on the football team at the same time. But anyway, that's the way it was. And then Bob Barr came in and it went from 17 pieces to about, oh, close to 60 pieces in about six months. And it went from playing the very simple military escort march, which we played for all the ROTC parades, to like Beethoven, you know. And he was just a tremendous influence on my life. And I, all I looked forward to every day at school was band practice. And the band got better and better, and I became the drum major. And at one point, Bob Barr asked me what I wanted to do. I was a senior when I graduated, and I said, well, 
I think radio looks pretty interesting. It looks pretty easy to do. And so he knew this uh, announcer, Ed Snyder, at WDAK Radio at that time, 1948. And, and he asked Ed if he would tutor me. And, and he did and became my mentor. And I became a 17-year-old radio announcer while I was still in high school, just doing weekend uh, gigs. And then when I graduated, I immediately decided, since Ed Snyder, my mentor, had graduated from the journalism school, the broadcast school at the University of Alabama, that I would do the same thing. At the time, the only broadcast school, university broadcast school in the nation was at the University of Alabama. And Ed Snyder had gone there and he graduated from there and he mentored me and so I decided to follow his footsteps. Big mistake. I, I went there um, in the summer. I graduated in June and then immediately went because I wanted to be able to get in and it's easier to get in in the summertime. And so I did get in and, but I was, it was a disaster because I, I was really pretty good at, at, at playing drums and being in the band, but I was a very terrible student in high school. And so that I, I, I had to leave. And, but they hired me at WDAK as a radio announcer. And, and that lasted for a little while. I, I was there a little over a year, I guess, and they finally got wise and got rid of me uh, because I was just a young kid and I was making a lot of mistakes. Well, that's what you do. That's how you learn. Right. You learn by making mistakes. And, and so what they gave me was very valuable. They gave me that early training where I could make those mistakes. They paid me almost nothing, but they did pay. They paid in my mistakes. And they finally reached the point that they got tired of my mistakes, I guess, and they let me go. But they said, we're farming you out. They were nice about it. And uh, I think they liked me, and I like them, actually. And so they knew about an opening at WLAG in LaGrange, and Ed Mullinax was the owner and manager of that station. He and the Callaway family owned WLAG. And so I was called into Alan Woodall's office, Alan Woodall Sr.'s office, and, and he said, you know, we just think you need some more experience. And, and we know that Ed Mullinax is looking for an announcer because Christmas is approaching and he needs a voice to do Santa Claus that the kids in the LaGrange area won't recognize. And so if you're willing to do Santa Claus, he's willing to hire you as an announcer. And so they farmed me out to, to LaGrange, WLAG, and I went there as an announcer and I did Santa Claus. Here I am, 17 years old, going ho, 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 and reading the little letters. All the little children were invited to send letters into WLAG, into Santa Claus, and you just sat there and read the letters and listed all the things they wanted for Christmas and said, ho, 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 and, and kind of gave them some idea you might bring them. You couldn't promise, you know, that would be a bad thing to do. But that's how I got started in LaGrange. Then after LaGrange, I was there a little while, and, and I decided I really did need college. And, and I really did. And so this time I tried Mercer University in Macon. I had matured a little bit. And so I could, I was a little bit better at studying. And so I got a job at WBML in LaGrange. I, I left and, uh, Macon. I left LaGrange and went to Macon, lived with my aunt and, and cousin, and went to Mercer and got a job at WBML. One of the wonderful things about Ed Mullinax was that I like working for him. He's a great guy. I mean, he was very paternal when it came to me. And uh, when I left, I gave him notice and, and went to WBML and went to work there and went started at Mercer. And two weeks later, the manager at WBML called me into his office. Well, what else do you want, you know? And he said, I just want you to know that I just got this letter from Ed Mullinax and it's a letter of recommendation for you. So. I didn't ask for it, I already had the job, and he sent that after I'd already gone. And I thought, wasn't that really a classy thing for him to do? And so I've met some really, really fine people along the way uh, over the years uh, who have helped me out doing things like that. Uh, I was very fortunate in, in a lot of my, my work experience. Uh, I left uh, WBML and went to WRBL, came back to Columbus. I'd gotten really sick. I had hepatitis at the time, and, and I came home, and WRBL hired me, and 
And I stayed there for a little while. I was working at night, and I was there when television came to Columbus. Wow. Television came to Columbus in 1953, and I had started work there early that year, and I was there when it came in. I was in radio, and of course they had openings in the radio because they were shifting people to television. And I got to see them first starting the first television uh, right. in Columbus. They weren't the first on the air. WDAK TV Channel 28 was the first on the air in Columbus. It became uh, WTVM later on. But anyway, I was at WRBL, and I, and I could see him getting, setting up the television while I'm in radio. I'm thinking, I want television, you know, but I'm in radio, and so I'm doing the best I can. Well, they had already built WRBL as a tremendous radio station. I mean, it was just really, really too big for a, a radio station. It had a, a, a studio. It had an, 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 uh, an auditorium studio. For radio, I thought, wow, that is really impressive. They don't have programs that big. And, but they knew what they were doing. They were ready for television, so they have converted that studio, that auditorium studio, into a television studio. It was big, and they could put the lights up and everything, so they had that in mind when they built it. Well, I'm in the radio control room. It's sitting here, and right next to me, next door in an old radio studio with the glass in between was the, the television uh, studio control room because they could see out into the auditorium studio, which was then the television studio, it's still there, it's still using it. And so I'm sitting in there and I could look through the window and see what they were doing over there. And I could see the monitor. And <laughs> at the beginning, they made a lot of mistakes, you know, like I did at the beginning. They made a lot of mistakes in television. And I'd look over and, uh, and they, they used 35 millimeter slides then. You know, they don't do that anymore with digital and everything, but they used to then. And they would put these slides up on the screen for commercials and so forth. And I'd look over there and they have a slide upside down, you know. And, and I'd laugh, you know. And, <laughs> and they got tired of that, so they put a curtain up so I couldn't see in there. <laughs> and, and laugh at what they were doing. But I wanted it on TV. And they did let me go on TV uh, a, couple of, a few times while I was still in radio. Uh, they were good about that. Uh, they had a program called Doodles. They had to fill a lot of time there because you know, they didn't have the network line in yet. They were running kinescopes, <coughs> which is film of the network programs. And, and so they had a lot of local programming. And that was good. They did, that's coming back, I understand, it needs to. It's really, it does, you know, yeah. the local television is where it's going to be for local stations. And you see, you're going to see more and more of that. They're doing it mainly in news now, but they'll probably expand to, uh, in, into other areas, things like this. But, but anyway, it was, it was really interesting. They had this program called Doodles, and they had a guy out in front of a blackboard out in the studio, or the girl was one, I don't remember. <laughs> and, and they would do doodles and talk about the doodles. And so they said, you want to come on and do some doodles? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I was anxious to get on television. So I went over, and the doodle I did was I just drew all these lines on this blackboard, all over this place, all these connected lines, and I put two dots in there. And so the host said, well, I can't figure that out. What is that? I said, that is a broken tape recorder that's gone crazy, and that's tape all over the, all over the room there, and you're seeing me looking through the tape. And so that was, that was my, one of my initiations. Now, another one was, was a commercial. One of the first things I did on television was a commercial. I worked on radio on in uh, in Sunday afternoons, out of Sunday afternoon shift, and they had a commercial that they were just starting for an electric razor, and they needed, they were doing it locally, and they needed someone to do it, and none of the regular TV announcers wanted to come in on Sunday afternoon. They said, well, the network is on over in radio at that time, so you could just walk over from the radio studio to the TV studio and, and do a commercial. And I said, well, yeah, sure. So I did a commercial and then they didn't have teleprompters and nobody to hold up a, a cue card. You had to memorize it. And so I did, I memorized this commercial. I think it was for Schick Razor. And, and, uh, and I got through it and, and it was like the first time I went on radio. The first time I went on radio, it was WDAK. It was in the Flowers Building and uh, down on Lower Broad. It was upstairs before they moved to better studios. And, and Ed Snyder, my mentor, says, come in uh, Saturday night 
he was going to do a disc jockey show uh, after 11 o'clock and, uh, and, and I'll show you how the board works and everything. So I went to the studio on a, on a Saturday night and went into the control room and, and had the big audio console there in front with all the attenuators and the VU meter and everything. He showed me how that worked with the two record turntables on each side back when they used records and then turntables had a microphone hanging down and as 11 o'clock approached he says you want to go on the air well, I'd never been on radio before in my life I was 17 years old and I said well sure and he says I'll tell you what you're gonna do uh, the network is gonna end at 11 o'clock and I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna let you sit down in the chair and when the network gives its cue like this is say ABC the American Broadcasting Company and you turn this pot down you turn that switch to the right and you say this is Radio Columbus WDAK it's 11 o'clock that's all you say you got that Radio Columbus WDAK 11 o'clock yeah, I got that. So I sat down in the chair, and the network's going, and I'm watching the VU meters. You know, that tells you the volume of the sound. And, and the guy says it, and the, and the announcer on ABC says that. And I turn the ABC pot down, I click the microphone now, and I do Radio Columbus, WDAK. It's 11 o'clock. Ed Snyder reaches over to my shoulder, starts the record, turns the pot up. I turn the microphone off. I get up, he sits down to do the disc jockey show. And I have to tell you, that was the magic moment. When I said that, did that station break, I became electrified. So a buzz went through my body. And I knew that was what I was gonna do. Well, we're gonna take a break. We'll hear more about it in just a minute. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hello, I'm Brian Mallard, inviting you to join us for a Block Party Vids, Sunday nights at 10. Hi, and welcome back to Kaleidoscope. I'm here with Dick McMichael. Now, Dick, go back to the Flowers Building in Columbus and tell us about your on-air, your live experience on radio. You were telling us how energizing it was. Well, yes, that was the very beginning, and, and that's the, the whole story. My During the station break at 11 o'clock, first thing I did on the radio, and the way it electrified me, and I feel this buzz throughout my body. Well, the same thing happened to a lesser degree when I did that TV commercial. And so I, I, I knew that's what I wanted. I've always been somewhat of a performer, and when I was a child, uh, uh, something that foreshadowed what I would later do is I would play radio. I would play movies too. And when I would play radio, I would set up my own little radio station. I would take a, a yard ruler and, and, and tie it to a desk or something, a chair, and, and I'd take a, an erectoscope wheel and I'd tape it on there or tie it on there to use for a microphone and I would recreate radio programs I'm just a little kid, and what I found was that to do commercials, I would read ads out of magazines, magazines the big magazines like Collier's and Saturday Evening Post when they were really big back then. And what I found was, later on I found this out, they were beautifully written. Those magazine ads were great, great broadcast ads. Uh, and. And I learned that much later on when I got into the business and started reading true ad copy. And a lot of the local ad copy, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta tell you, it's terrible. Well, it's terrible. I'm, I'm gonna talk about it now uh, because I don't do it now. And, but they would, the sponsors would want to advertise everything they had in the store in 30 seconds and, and minutes. They had a lot of minute commercials back then. So they try to list all this stuff and the copy would be like 40 seconds long and you were supposed to get it in in 30 seconds. 
And so you couldn't do much with it, but just read as fast as you could. Now, when you read that magazine copy, it almost read itself. And because that was the way it was written, it was written the way people talk. Right. And, and, uh, and I noticed this later on, like, we had a very few, uh, when I was working at WSB Radio in Atlanta, uh, we had very few national commercials that we actually read locally on that 50,000 watt clear channel, Voice of the South, it was called at the time. It was a really big, great station, it really was. I, I had a wonderful time working there. So I had some hard times too, but it was really quite an experience. And, but anyway, we would get, uh, I remember a commercial that we had for, uh, for uh, Tetley Tea. And, and I would read that and I thought, wow, what beautiful copy. I mean, it reads itself almost and you, you can't go wrong with it. And uh, so that, that's what that boils down to. So you enjoy doing commercial work? No, that, I enjoyed doing a really good commercial at the time, but that's an interesting thing that happened also. I, after a little while, I, got, I decided that here I am telling people about all of these wonderful products and the things they will do for them and so forth, and I don't really know that it's true. And I don't, and... I got into news, and I got away from doing a lot of, I still did some commercials because you did everything back then in 1957, 58, 59, 60, 61. Those were the years I worked at WSB. Uh, and, and stations back then, you would do a little bit of everything. Mainly I did the news. I ended up mainly doing the news in the morning on WSB, which is what I wanted. But I still had to do one record show, one music show. And in that music show, there would be commercials. And uh, so I still had to do uh, some commercials. But uh, once I really got going in news, I stopped. And you always try to draw this line between the sales department mm -hmm. and news. And if you wanted the public to trust your news, if you wanted them to, for it to have credibility, then it, you had to have that line. And it was always the attempt to cross that line. And fortunately, uh, management would uphold what you were doing in news quite often and protect you, because they knew that to have those winning newscasts, people had to trust what you were saying. Right. And uh, a lot of them would hold that line and and the manager of the station will not tell you you had to do something that some salesperson wanted you to do to get in good favor with a client but the salespeople were always trying it and and that was the game and the game was that they could they could talk to us and actually some of the things they wanted were legitimate i mean they would come in and say well we got this new business opening and and, and we'd like you for you to be there for the ribbon cutting. And we'd weigh it. And if it really was news, and sometimes it was, I mean, you get 300 new employees in a city, you got a news story. And so, yeah, we'd do it. And, but it was always that, always that tension there. And as, as far as I know, it, it's still there and never will go away because that's the nature of the beast. And it's just the fight that has to be fought and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. So you went into news. Yep. And you really you got feel me like off you, on a side dive tribe there. That's okay. <laughs> you feel like you, you found your calling when you got into news. I mean, you were you're out of doing ads and uh, radio so much. You were on TV doing the news. Yeah, and I still did some radio. I was still doing some radio when I was on WTVM. I didn't consider it much radio. I didn't really consider being in radio. I did a little, I think it was about 30 second afternoon newscast that really was, was really designed to promote the evening television news. I mean, that was the trade off. The radio station got this little newscast, this news headlines, and we got to say at the, you know, at the end, 
to watch our newscast that night, so it was really a promotion. But it was news headlines, so I did do that. And was that in an era where there were still some households that didn't have TV but had radio? Mm, that was way, way, way back. I'm sure that's, that's true some now, mm -hmm. but but no, 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 no. That 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 started going away in the 50s. Wow, I didn't realize we had switched over that quickly. Oh, television, once it really hit, yeah. it exploded. You know, television started after World War II. It was developed before World War II. They had, they had a television broadcast from uh, the World's Fair in New York in 1939, but it really didn't start until after World War II. And so right after World War II, the stations went on the air in the really big cities. They went on in like New York and Chicago and, and San Francisco and, and the big cities, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and, but not in the middle-sized cities like Columbus. Mm -hmm. And in 1948 is when that really hit. It hit before that in some places like New York and so forth. But 1948 is when it really hit. 1948 is when WSB went on the air in Georgia and WAGA TV and I forget what Channel 11 was at the time. I forget the call letters. I think it was WXTX or something like that. No, I'm, I'm not sure what it was. But anyway, uh, those three stations went on the air in 48. And radio was still king because people didn't have television sets. Right. And so it didn't really come to the smaller markets until 1953. Like when I told you before, I saw it come on the air at WRBL in 1953. What had happened was they didn't, wouldn't let the smaller stations go on the air. They wouldn't give them licenses in, in 48. And it took those, that many years to 53 that it opened up. Well, when it opened up, it changed the ballgame. I mean, uh, it went from some fairly sophisticated urban type shows like the show of shows on NBC. Not that everything was sophisticated on NBC and ABC and CBS at the time in Dumont. Uh, but they did have some. But they mainly were popular in really urban areas. And so what happened was once the station started going on all over the country and these smaller stations, the more rural audiences came into play. And they liked the Beverly Hillbillies and, and shows like that, Green Acres. Mm -hmm. And not sophisticated, but they weren't bad. They were funny shows. They were good shows. But it, it changed, it shifted. It shifted away from what it was, and the whole the whole ball game shifted. And I remember, you know, when the, when the television first started, uh, a lot of local stations thought, "Oh no, we're gonna we can't get a license if we don't do news." You had to promise to do news and, and public affairs to get a license. And and so the stations would say, "Well, yeah, we'll do news. It's going to be lost, but but you know, we'll get the license and we'll make a lot of money that way. But we'll just." lose some money with the news. Well, <laughs> in no time at all, they discovered that people were watching the news and wanted to watch the news, and the news became a profit center. And why the matter of they were going to just lose money on the news, they started making money on the news, and they started making a lot of money on the news, and to this day, they're making a lot of money on the news. Again, with ad sales. Of course. Yeah. I know my family didn't get television for quite a while after it came out. Really? Yeah. Mill workers, Bibb City. Yeah, so it was some Well, time. we had quite a few. I can remember when it first came on and, and, uh, and the growth in the, in the television sets. People would go like to Robinson Radio and they'd have a television set in the window, in the show window. And crowds would be out there watching shows and that because they didn't have television sets. But it didn't take a long time that people started putting out the money and going in debt to buy the television sets were very expensive. Mm -hmm. and, to buy, and I can remember before television hit Columbus, uh, people tried to watch Atlanta. It wasn't easy because it didn't come in very well because of uh, atmospheric conditions and right. so forth and Pine Mountain. But my sister got a television set in the, uh, the, her family. and. She had an antenna on top of her house that was almost big as the house. I mean, that thing shot way up and it was huge to try to pick up Atlanta. And sometimes it picked it up. And sometimes it picked it up really well. And a lot of times there was a lot of snow. 
But I remember enjoying a lot going over to her house, and she became a very popular relative with that television set. Right. <laughs> I remember as a as a girl, since we lived in rural Georgia, going out and turning the antenna to try to pick up the station. And like you said, it was this huge thing on a on a big metal pole. Right. Well, we're gonna uh, shift to commercial. We'll be right back after these messages. Hello, I'm Brian Mallard, inviting you to join us for Minstrels on the Block Thursday nights at ten. And welcome back to Kaleidoscope. I'm Rachel Elliott. I'm here with Dick McMichael. So, Dick, tell us about your career with Channel 3. Is that WRBL? Yes. Well, yes, as, as, I, as I told you earlier, I started there on radio and television. Came on while I was there. And I got drafted, and I went overseas, eventually went to uh, Munich, Germany, and I was in an Army band and ended up being an Army band drum major of the 30th Army Band, and I was on, I was on the air one time there. Uh, the band did a concert for Armed Forces Radio, uh, and, and the band knew that I was, had been a radio announcer, and they asked me to MC it. So I did that one, one Armed Forces Radio program. Uh -huh. And then I came back after two years in the Army, and, and I told Jim Woodruff, Jim Woodruff Jr., who was the part owner and general manager of uh, WRBO, that I really preferred television. And he said, okay. And so he hired me to be a booth announcer. That's when you had booth announcers. You had live announcers in booths. They don't do that anymore. Everything's recorded. And, well, maybe not everything, but you sat in the booth, and there, and in a number of stations it was this way, you had the, the, the sound control board in front of you, and you controlled the sound, the studio sound. And you had a monitor, and you did the station breaks. The network program would be on, you know, guiding light or something like that. And the break would come, this is CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System, the eye would come up on the screen, and then the, they would cut to local. You turn on your microphone, quite often you do a live commercial with slides, 35 millimeter slides, or promos. And then you'd, you know, maybe, I forgot, 30 seconds or a minute, and you'd turn the mic off, turn the network pot back on, and, and do that. And in the meanwhile, it's, you're sitting right next to the director, and the director's directing the studio mm -hmm. programs, uh, doing the switching cameras and so forth. And I got sort of fascinated with that, and I was still an announcer, and I was doing commercials then, too. I was doing live commercials. Uh, made a little extra money that way. And so I told him, I said, you know, I wanna tr I'd like to try my hand at directing. And, uh, and they had let me direct once before when I was still in radio. One to do it one time. <laughs> it was incredible. They would do things like that. They didn't. I didn't mess up, so it would turn out okay. But I said, you know, uh, and they had this Speck and Doyle show on. Now, the Speck and Doyle show was a country music program. Came on, I think, at 1 o'clock. And, and uh, it was a live studio, and it was a live country band, Speck and Doyle Wright. And they had a few other guys playing with them. And, and uh, the director that was doing it was happy to let me direct it. And so he pulled out, and they let me direct that show. Well, I use it as a laboratory. I use it to learn about what you could do uh, in, in television, st uh, studio work. And so at first I did it just the way they'd been doing it. The way they had, did, had done it before was they just had the, the uh, country band standing in front of a, a flat that was uh, uh, painted like a barn set, you know, gave the idea of being out in the country and so forth. And they just did it, did it with flat lighting, real bright scoops, and, uh, and, uh, and just took uh, formatted shots, you know, open with a cover shot, go to a mid bench shot, whatever you call it now, and, and a close-up, and so forth. And it was so static. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to change this. Uh, 
um, I'm going to learn something. And we're, we're not going to do just from that set anymore. We're going to start doing like some of these music shows on the network. We're going to start doing separate numbers, have them move to another little set for, for that number. And we're going, to, we're going to real lighting. We're going to network lighting. And the network had this film that showed you how to light. We did it for the local stations to watch. And so I watched it. And I went out and I started arranging the lights with key lights, soft fill, even some limbo lighting, backlighting, and, and we had this engineer in there. Uh, gosh, what was his name? You'd know it if I could think of it. He, he ended up being the assistant chief engineer to Joe Gamble. And, uh, but anyway, he was a great guy. And, and he started fighting me a little bit, you know. Uh, you, can't, you can't light that way, Dick, you know. That's not enough light and so forth. And, and I said, well, the network's doing it that way. Uh, they had the lenses closed down. And I said, we're going to have to open up the lenses. And, and that's the way they do it. So I started doing it. And after a while, he told me, he says, you know, I, at first, uh, uh, I didn't want to do that because we had the studio lit flat and we could keep the lenses closed down and that made the tube life longer for those cameras. Right. And so we didn't have to replace those tubes so often because they're expensive. But he said, but I knew what you were doing was right and so I decided to go along with you. <laughs> and, and he did. And, and, uh, and not only did he decide to go along with me, he started making suggestions on how to make it better. And he was good. And so that was a big breakthrough, you know. And I enjoyed the show, and I had these guys doing a lot of different things. And that one, one day I had the theme of uh, uh, ancient Rome because they had some columns. I saw some columns they had used for a commercial. I said, we're going to pull those out and put them in the studio, and we're going to set up a Roman set. And I'm going to put laurel leaves around the heads of these country music players, and they're going to have on togas, and, and they're going to do their country music from ancient Rome. And I use limbo lighting. And, and uh, so one day they came to me, and Spex says, you know, Dick, we figured you were crazy. And he said, but we are really getting the cards and the letters now. They're just really pouring in. And he says, and we go out on the street, and some people tell us, you know, we have to watch you every day to see what you're going to do next. Okay. And uh, so it worked. Yeah. And, and I learned a lot. But I didn't stick with it. I, I, went, I went into news, eventually really went into news. And, and, but I had a basic idea of what was going on in the studio. And that helps. When you're covering news, it helps because news is visual on television. You, your pictures and, and you have to think visually and, mm -hmm. and that's the way that works. Well, from WRBL, you went to WTVM Channel Well, I worked at WRBL for quite a while, mm -hmm. a number of times. Jim Woodruff Jr. hired me four times. Four times. And, uh, and that was a really in interesting experience. And I did it in a lot of different positions. I was started out as a, a radio announcer and became a TV announcer and director and then came back from WSB Radio as the program manager for the Woodruff radio stations, WRBL in Columbus, WGPC in Albany, and a station, I forget the call letters, in Bainbridge. And, and I did that for a while. And, but I moved over into television news and about 61 or 62. And from that point on, I was really, really in television news. And, and I, I, oh, I was there when a lot of interesting things happened. When the, when the Vietnam War started right. and, the, and uh, we covered the troops, the first airborne, the first air assault division, the 11th air assault division uh, that became the first CAV. And we covered that training and President Johnson coming to Columbus and speaking to the troops in Doughboy Stadium before the first ones were sent over when we really started sending the troops over into Vietnam. And we covered all of that and we had a, 
of uh, the one time that I was on uh, the Walter Cronkite News, it was with an interview with a soldier who refused to wear his uniform as a protest to the Vietnam War. And, and we had uh, run that locally and the network learned, learned of it and wanted it and, and they ran that on, uh, on uh, CBS. And, and that was a very interesting period. I, I stayed at RBL in about 1968 that time and got a little bit antsy again and, and uh, got offered a job at uh, WAGA Channel 5 in Atlanta and I took that and I worked at Channel 5 a little less than a year. Uh, I learned a lot there, wasn't too happy there, but just to be honest with you, but I learned a lot, interviewed a lot of interesting people, uh, I, uh, you, you know, people like Richard Nixon wow. and, uh, and, uh, and Rockefeller, Winthrop Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, and, and uh, it, was, it was very, very interesting, and Sammy Davis Jr., it was a very, very interesting uh, period that I went through there, and Lester Maddox decided he was going to run for governor, for president while he was governor, and, uh, and of course he wasn't really very serious and didn't do it very long, but we covered all of that. And then I got an offer, I was there for less than a year, and I got a telephone call from this guy offering me, he had seen me on Channel 5 on Sunday night anchoring the news, and he said, we have two openings. He was uh, the personnel manager for, uh, for uh, Cosmos Broadcasting. And, and they owned stations in, in uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Montgomery, Alabama, and Toledo, Ohio. And he said, we have openings for the 11 o'clock news in Montgomery and, and Columbia. And I said, well, I would not be interested in Montgomery. Uh, George Wallace was governor and uh, probably not gonna make a lot of people happy with this, but I did not support George Wallace and didn't want to cover him. And so I, I went to Columbia and auditioned there and they hired me. I stayed there four years and that was an interesting four years. Oh, I did a lot of investigative reporting there, and, and that's when you had the, the student riots at the University of South Carolina. They were protesting the Vietnam War and did a lot of environmental stories. That's when the environmental movement started, and they were going to build a nuclear fuel reprocessing plant at Barnwell, and, and that became very controversial. I covered that. Anyway, I left there and went back to WRBL. After four years, I went back to WRBL as news director and eventually Vice President of News and Public Affairs at WRBL. And, and I did that for quite a while, from oh, 1972 to 1986. And in 1986, we had news station owner Jim Woodruff had died in an automobile accident. Uh, and, uh, and so the station ended up being owned by Malcolm Glazier. Uh, who owns the Manchester <laughs> soccer team, football team now, and the Tampa Bucks, his family. Wow. But anyway, uh, I was there for a while and, and uh, had some differences and, and went to Channel 9 in 1986 and stayed on Channel 9 from 86 to when I retired in 2000. Wow, that's quite a career in a nutshell. What was your most memorable newscast? Well, you can't boil it down to one. There were too many. Uh, okay, give us several scenarios. Well, there, you know, like the last one, the very last one, is the one that is the most recent and it stands out. It was the last time I anchored news, and and at the end, I told the audience goodbye and and uh, how good it was to be with them all those years and and thank them for watching me and and I uh, like to uh, feel that they were my friends and when I looked at a camera I didn't look at a camera I looked at a friend and and I was talking to a friend and and that was my approach and and it was uh, it was a moving moment for me and I was told that there were some tears in the control room and uh, Richard Hyatt was there from the paper and covered it and they put it on the front page uh, the next day. And, and that, uh, that was quite a moment because I had been on the air quite a while and had covered many, many, many stories and had done, I don't know, probably 20 documentaries over the years 
on uh, at WTVM, and I had done documentaries at WRBL. The last thing I did, one of the last things I did at WRBL was a documentary about the Roosevelt Wilderness Camp. And, <laughs> and I, right after it was broadcast, I switched jobs. I switched from RBL to WTVM. And while I'm at WTVM, the Georgia Broadcasters Association uh, selected that documentary as the documentary of the year, that year, oh, no. in 1986. So I had won that, and I was at yeah. Channel 9. Channel 3 called me and said, would you go to the banquet and accept that for us? And Channel 9 said, okay. And so I did. <laughs> While I was still at Channel 9, I accepted the, docu the uh, Channel 3 Home for Christmas was the name of it, and I'll never forget it. It was, it really impressed me, even me. <laughs> well, there were a lot of historical moments with newscasting. Um, you know, I introduced interviewed some really interesting people. When I was yeah. at WSB Radio, for instance, I interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, awesome. First Lady Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yeah. I interviewed Dr. Jonas Salk, who invented the Salk vaccine that began the end of polio, and a number of people, because they, a lot of people came through Atlanta while I was there, a lot of big time celebrities that, that, uh, that I interviewed uh, during those years, but we have them in Columbus too. I remember one of the most interesting uh, interviews I had was with uh, John Wayne, when he was at Fort Benning to do the Green Berets. I went out there to, uh, interview him and I had contacted CBS and asked him if, if they wanted a bit for radio uh, interview with John Wayne they said well you know they would be interested so I went out and uh, and they finally agreed to give me an, an interview and it was out there on the set so to speak out at, out at Fort Benning at night and I started asking him questions, and I said, are you making a propaganda film? And he said, no, you're just trying to provoke me. I make the film to entertain people, and he turned and walked off, left. And, uh, oh my gosh. and I, that was about a three minute interview, I guess. So I went back to the station, and, uh, and the next morning I got a call from, from his, uh, what do they call him, publicist, PR guy, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, the Duke, they called him the Duke, you know, he felt bad about that, and he wants, to, wants you to come back out, and he'll give you another interview, and, uh, and he'll explain why he did that. And I said, well, sure, so I went back out, and we went out, on the set at Fort Benning again, and he said, why don't you guys, me and the publicist, go back to my apartment, and, uh, and I'll meet you there in about an hour, and I'll give you an interview. We did, the other an hour, he showed up. We sat at the kitchen table in that apartment. He broke out uh, some Jack Daniels, and says, uh, I'm gonna have a Jack Daniels, would you like one? Normally, I would not. I would not drink on the job, so to speak. I was not going to turn down a Jack Daniels with John Wayne. <laughs> and so I didn't, and we both had a Jack Daniels, and he gave me an interview that ran close to an hour. Wow. And so I called, a lot of interesting stuff. So I called CBS, and I told them I had it. And they, I said, do you want the stuff from the night before? Do you want what I did when I went back out in the morning? And they said, send it all to us. So I sent it all to them. The only thing they used was the three minutes I did the night before. None of the stuff I did at the second interview because that interview the night before uh, was controversial. And the Vietnam War was right. very controversial at that time. Right. And, and he had made the statement, well, when I asked him about people who had gone to Canada rather than serve in the Vietnam War, and he called them cowards. and, and said things like that, so that's what the network used. Wow. Amazing. 
Jack Daniels with John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a commercial break. Oh, by the way. Yes, sir. I like John Wayne, and, and, <laughs> and he did apologize to me. And, and when, he, when he came in, and I got to tell I said, now, you know, I got to tell you, I'm a fan of yours. I mean, I was being honest. I said, you just made a movie called, called The War Wagon. And I really enjoyed that. It was very entertaining. And, and you got a good write-up in uh, it was one of the big magazines. I think it was Life or Look or something. And one of them. And, and he said, you know, I don't even read those. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't blame him. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Kaleidoscope. I'm Rachel Elliott. I'm here with Dick McMichael. So Dick, tell us about what you're doing now since you've retired. Tell us about your book and your blog. Well, when I retired, uh, I stayed with the station about a year in the public affairs uh, position. I didn't do much. I did a little bit, wrote editorials and so forth. And then I left there, uh, uh, and after a little while, they had a layoff, and uh, they laid off a bunch of people, including me. But I'd already retired, so to speak, and everything, and, and so I didn't think anything of it. And anyway, anyway, a short time after that, they asked me if I'd come back and do some special reports for them. And I did. And uh, I did a number of those, did a number of interviews of, of uh, veterans from World War II during the uh, Iraq War and, uh, and Afghanistan War. And include one of those veterans was Doug Wallace, by the way, right. who had been the great weatherman from Channel 3. And I didn't realize he was a World War II veteran. And, and he, uh, uh, he had won a silver star. I did not know that. In Germany during World War II. I didn't know that either and, until, this, and I'd worked for him for 20 years or more, and I didn't know that, but I learned that in this interview. And he gave me a great interview, and a bunch of people did. So I did a bunch of special things for them after that. We, we remained on good terms, and still on good terms. And uh, uh, I did a documentary with Jimmy Carter. Uh, I went over to Plains, and Lee Brantley, the general manager, wanted to go with me on that one because he, he's, a, he's a photographer. He, he does that uh, as a hobby, and uh, he's really into it. And he wanted to be able to go and meet Jimmy and Jimmy Carter, President Carter, and take some pictures of him. So we did. And so I, I, I interviewed President Carter uh, in downtown Plains, and we walked down the main street, and the camera followed us, and we went into this hotel they have there now that's in one of the old buildings that at one time was a store, and now they converted it into this really interesting hotel that uh, has rooms that represent different eras right. of, of uh, Plains. And President Carter, I have a hard time calling him Jimmy once he's President of the United States. A lot of people still do, and he probably wouldn't care. But he gave me this great interview. Uh, and, uh, and we did a show on that. We did, a, we did a, some special reports that ran in newscasts, and then we did a, I think it was a half hour documentary that they, they ran in prime time. So I did a bunch of those uh, after I'd retired. I wasn't working regularly for the station, and uh, my late wife uh, Melba uh, had a chronic uh, disease, and and uh, and, uh, and she died, and, and eventually, and and uh, and I 
after a while, I, I went back and did some more things for Channel, for Channel 9. They asked me to do them. And, and I haven't done anything in, in a number of years. Uh, I have written some magazine articles, Columbus in the Valley magazine, and, uh, and of course, the blog. And I started the blog, just something to do. And that's basically still what it is. Uh, I might blog once a week, sometimes maybe two or three times a week, depending on, you know, what I feel like, like doing now. The big moment, of course, was when I did the Cali story. Uh, when former Army Lieutenant William Kelly apologized for the massacre at My Lai at the Kiwanis Club. I was there. And afterwards, I did a blog on it. And the paper read my blog. And Mike Owens called me and asked me if uh, I would do the story for the paper. And we collaborated. He and I wrote it together, really. My name was on it, but he was the editor. And, and uh, it was a long front page story the next day. And the wire services picked it up, and it went around the world. And uh, uh, the networks picked it up. All three networks picked it up. So it became an international story because Kelly was this international figure. And it all started on my blog. Wow. And to this day, the most hits I get in a month on that blog is that story. The apology, of the Kelly apology story to this day is still where I get the most hits on that blog. So when you do a blog, you might be thinking about you're writing that day just like you may be writing for a newspaper or whatever, but you're building up a backlog. You're building up 300 stories, more than that on there now. And it's amazing that you would think they would be reading mainly what you wrote last week, but they were reading stuff that you wrote two years ago, and a year ago, and a week ago. And it's, and it's interesting, and not only do they keep reading that story, uh, they keep commenting on that story, you know, writing comments. And those comments have come from all over the world, some from Vietnam, and some from a, Viet a Vietnamese man that survived that massacre. Yeah. Uh, he sent me a comment. He was in Germany. He was a Vietnamese, but he, Vietnamese, but he had moved to Germany. And so, Blogs can be very, very influential, and and I, you know, I, I from time to time I think, well, you know, why don't you just stop doing that? And then, like the other day, I got this Facebook comment from my grandson Benjamin. He uh, he just graduated from he had not just graduated when he graduated from the from Air Force Basic Training in San Antonio, Texas, at Lachlan Air Base. I went out there with the family uh, to attend that, and I took pictures. He, they didn't have a regular Air Force band at the base, you know, just a band that was stationed for the base. They would, they would make up a band of, of uh, trainees, and it's not too hard to do because of so many kids in high school bands. And so they, there's a drum and bugle corps that they would, they got together, and he ended up playing first trumpet in the drum and bugle corps. And that was great, because I went, while I was there, he took me to meet his commanding officer, this colonel, and, and he said, you know, uh, the colonel said, he told me that uh, you had been in an army band, and uh, this must be really something special for you to come here and see him playing in this Air Force band. And of course it was. And that wasn't what he was going to do. He, you know, he didn't end up in an Air Force band. But anyway, uh, the other day I got this Facebook uh, message from him that some of his buddies from that 
training, that basic training there, had found my blog and were taking pictures out of it and putting it up on, on the inter internet uh, and making comments and so forth, you know. And, and I reflect on that and I say, well, I guess I'll keep doing some blogs, you know. Uh, because of the people that, the feedback I get from, right. from certain people. Wow. Well, why don't you tell our viewers how they can find your blog and also your book? Well, they can find my blog at dicksworld.wordpress.com. Now, that's a lot to remember, right? Dick's World, all run together, D-I-C-K-S-W-O-R-L-D dot word, W-O-R-D-P-R-E-S-S dot com. Okay, uh, there's an easier way. You just Google Dick's World. Okay. And it'll come up on there, and you click that, and it'll go to the blog. Two clicks. And uh, so, yeah, that'd be nice, you know, if people click on there and give me comments and so forth. The book, uh, I wrote in 2005. Uh, that's when it was published, anyway. And uh, it's my life story, and it's... Uh, my broadcast career, and a lot of it's a broadcast career. There's a lot of history in here, uh, broadcast history in Columbus, and some Columbus history. I've had people come up and tell me, you know, I didn't, I was wondering about that book, and then I started reading, and I realized it has a lot of history in it. Yeah. And, and it does, uh, because it, it would, because I'm a Columbus native, and I grew up here. And most of my broadcasting career has been here. I worked in other places, but mainly uh, it has been here. Uh, and uh, you can still get this book. I had it in the local bookstores for a while when it first came out. It was in Barnes and Noble and Noble and uh, Borden Books when we had that here. I was at Walden Books, one or the other. Walden, yeah. And uh, and but you can still get it online. You can order it from xlibris.com or you, or you can get it on Amazon and so uh, makes a good Christmas present for for grandma and granddad <laughs> yeah I'm thinking of my mom <laughs> thank you for being here with us and giving us this interview today Dick McMichael wow it's great you're a Columbus legend that's it for this week's Kaleidoscope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. My pleasure.